This lecture is part of a series of online lectures on rings and modules and will be about Hensel's lemma. So Hensel's lemma says roughly that approximate solutions to some problem can be lifted to exact solutions. So what do we mean by a solution to a problem or an approximate solution or whatever? Well, we work over some ring and this ring might be, it might be a ring of polynomials over a field or it might be um, a ring of p-adic integers or more generally, it might be the completion of some ring. And what we do is we have some problem. For instance, we might find, want to find a root of a polynomial f with coefficients in R. And we might find an approximate root alpha. For instance, we might find a root that's um, f alpha is equal to zero modulo z to the n in um, the string R, or it might be congruent to zero modulo p to the n over the p adix or something for some value of n. And Hensler's lemma says that under certain conditions, if we've got an approximate root, then we can modify it slightly to obtain an exact root. And um, there are actually enormous numbers of versions of Hensel's lemma in the literature. For instance, instead of finding approximate roots, we could find an approximate factorization of f into polynomials g and h modulo some power of z or p to the n. So finding a root would be the special case when one of these polynomials has degree one. And there are various different rings we can use and so on. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give one of the simplest cases of Hensel's lemma. So we're going to take our ring R to be just the p-adic integers. And our problem, we're just going to take f of x is equal to x to the n plus a n minus 1, x to the n minus 1 and so on plus a zero. And we just want to find roots of f. So suppose alpha zero is a root mod p. So we have f of alpha zero is congruent to zero mod p. And suppose that f prime of alpha zero is not congruent to zero mod p. Then we can lift alpha to a root of f with, with alpha as congruent to alpha zero mod p. So it's saying that an approximate root can be lifted to an exact root provided this slightly mysterious condition about the derivative of f um, holds. And we will see why we need this condition um, a little bit later. Um, so in order to see why this is true, it may be easiest just to work out an example. Suppose, suppose we want to solve um, x squared equals seven in the three adic integers. So we find an approximate root alpha zero. So we want alpha zero squared is congruent to seven modulo three. And obviously we can just take alpha zero equals one. That will do fine. And now we lift to alpha one. So we want alpha one squared. We want this to be congruent to seven modulo three squared. So what's alpha one going to be? Well, alpha one is going to be alpha zero plus three times some number. Let's call it B. And let, let's try and figure out what B has to be. So we want alpha zero plus three B squared should be congruent to seven modulo three squared. Well, alpha zero is one. So this just says one plus um, 6b plus 3 squared times something we don't really care about is congruent to 7 modulo 3 squared. And now 1 is congruent to 7 modulo 3 and this is all divisible by 3 so we can sort of divide through by 3 and we find 2b plus 3 times some junk that we don't really care about um, is congruent to um, 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 some junk that we still don't care about, modulo 3. Um, and now what we find is um, we need to solve 2b as congruent to something mod 3, which we can do because 2 is not congruent to 0 mod 3. 
So we can solve for b, and if you go through this, you find b is actually equal to 1. So we've got alpha 1 is equal to 1 plus 3 times 1. Now we do the same thing for alpha 2. So we want alpha 2 squared is common to 7 mod 3 cubed. And if we do this again, we, we, we copy the same thing. We put alpha 2 is equal to alpha 1 plus 3c, and we find alpha 1 squared plus 2 alpha 1 times 3c plus something is congruent to 7 mod 3 squared, mod 3 cubed. And now if we um, unravel this, we find this comes down to saying that um, 2c is congruent to something or other mod 3, if we expand this out and rearrange terms and so on. And again, we can solve this because 2 is not congruent to 0 mod 3. And what is this funny number 2? Where, where does this number 2 keep coming from? Well, if you go through the analysis, you find that 2 is actually the derivative. So we, we take the derivative of x squared minus 7, which is 2x, and evaluate it at x equals alpha 0. So the reason we can solve this at each step is because the derivative of x squared minus 7 at our approximate root is non-zero mod 3. So, so the key point is this is not congruent to 0 modulo our prime p. So this is um, where this condition about the derivative of f being non-zero being, being non mod p arises. Um, now you, um, um, so let me give a few more examples of this. First of all, let's try and solve x squared is congruent to 5, sorry, x squared equals 5 over the two added integers. Now we can solve this mod 2, so 1 squared is congruent to 1, uh, is congruent to 5 modulo 2, and it's even 1 squared is congruent to 5 modulo 2 squared. So now we want to solve something squared is congruent to 5 modulo 2 cubed, which is 8. And this has no solutions. So we can't lift the solution modulo 2 squared to, the, to a solution modulo 2 cubed. And if you look at this, we've, we've got this equation x squared minus 5, and its derivative is 2x. And this is congruent to 0 mod 2 at, at the x0, which our, 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 sorry, at alpha 0. So our initial approximation was 1. So here the condition about the derivative breaks down and the attempt to find a root also breaks down. Um, so um, we really do need this condition or something similar. Um, now we could prove Hensel's lemma just by going through this example a little bit more carefully and using an arbitrary polynomial instead of x squared minus 7, and checking that this coefficient we need at each step really is the derivative of f at alpha 0. So that would give one proof of Hensel's lemma. I'm not actually going to give that proof in detail, although it's not difficult to work out for yourself, because I'm going to give a different proof. What I want to show is that Hensel's lemma is really just Newton's method. for finding roots of polynomials. Well, at least it is in the special case we're talking about. So let's just recall what Newton's method is. So Newton's method says that if we're trying to find a zero of a function, so we've got some function here and we want to find it zero, we choose an approximate zero, let's call it x zero, and then we just draw the tangent line to the graph of the function and find out where it intersects the x-axis, and this is going to be x1. And then we draw the tangent line again, and this is going to be x2, and we carry on like this. And under good conditions, Newton's method converges incredibly fast to a root of a polynomial, or for that matter, any reasonable function. Under bad conditions, Newton's, condition, Newton's method behaves dreadfully. Um, and it's actually quite difficult analysing Newton's method over the reals because its behaviour is really quite complicated. Um, anyway, so let's write down the formulas for Newton's method. So we have xn plus 1 
is equal to xn minus f of xn over f prime of xn. That follows easily because xn plus 1 is xn minus this distance here. And this distance here is just this vertical distance here, which is f of xn divided by the slope of this line, um, which is f prime of xn. So, so this is Newton's method. Um, and now we're going to use this to prove Hensel's lemma because we're going to take x0 to be our initial approximation. We're going to take it to be a root modulo p of some function. We were now working over the p addicts. And all we want is that f prime of x0 is not congruent to 0 mod p. So let's see how Newton's method works in this. Well, Newton's method says that xn plus 1 is equal to xn minus f of xn over f prime of xn. And now what we're going to do um, is um, expand um, f of xn plus 1 as a Taylor series. So this is going to be f of xn minus f prime of xn times f of xn over f prime of xn plus f double prime of xn over 2 factorial times f of xn over f prime of xn all squared minus higher terms. So this is just a Taylor series and okay we're working with Taylor series over the periodic numbers instead of over the reals and I could spend an hour developing the theory of Taylor series over the periodics but it's a bit pointless because it's very similar to the Taylor series over the reals and I'm simply not going to bother. Um, and now what you do is if you look carefully at this you will notice the first two terms cancel. The sum is zero. In fact, you can think of Newton's method as choosing this correction in order for the first two terms of the Taylor series of f, x, n plus 1 to cancel. And yes, there are refinements of Newton's method where you choose this thing to make the first three terms cancel, but there's not really all that much use for them. Um, so we're left with the remaining terms here, and let's see what we've got here. Well, um, here we notice that f prime of xn is not congruent to 0 mod p, so we can divide by it perfectly well. And f xn is congruent to 0 mod p, so we find that f of xn over f prime of xn squared is now congruent to 0 mod, uh, sorry, um, I should have said that uh, the, the, sorry, this isn't mod p, it's modulo p to the power of something. So that's, so that's modulo p. This is modulo p to the something. And this is now going to be 0 mod p to the 2 something because we're squaring it. Um, you might get a bit nervous about this 2 factorial. Um, you know, in characteristic 2, maybe that's going to um, gum things up. But that doesn't really matter because we notice that at least if f is a polynomial, the double prime of fxn is always divisible by 2 factorial. And in general, the, nth, the third derivative of xn is divisible by 3 factorial and so on. So, so we seem to get denominators here, but in fact they cancel out with numerators, so we can ignore them. Anyway, what we see is that if f of xn is congruent to 0 mod p to the um, k, this implies f of xn plus 1 is congruent to 0 mod p to the 2k. So we've got incredibly rapidly convergence. At each step we double the number of correct p addict digits. Um, if you've done a numerical analysis course you, you probably remember that something similar happens for Newton's method. When it starts converging it, the number of correct decimal digits um, roughly doubles each step. Um, there are also variations of Hensel's lemma where the derivative here need might be 0 mod p but might be non-zero modulo some higher power of p and then we get a rather more complicated condition um, for um, convergence. Um, um, in, instead of f being a 0 modulo p it must be a 0 modulo some slightly higher power of p. Um, so um, I'll just finish with a couple of examples um, of Hensel's lemma 
um, for power series rather than over the p-addicts. So, so far I was proving Hensel's lemma for p-addicts. As I said, you can prove something similar over many other complete rings. So I'll just finish with a couple of examples. Suppose you take the polynomial, which I'm going to think of as a power series, y squared minus x squared minus x cubed. And now you notice that if you just look at the degree two terms, the degree two terms factorise as y minus x times y plus x. And by applying Hensel's lemma for power series, instead of for periodic numbers, the fact that this factorises uh, in the degree two terms factorises implies that we get that we can lift this factorization to um, a power series factorization. We get y minus x times the square root of 1 plus x times y plus x times the square root of 1 plus x. Well, let's try this with y squared minus x cubed. Well, again, the degree two terms factorise as y times y. But if we had tried applying Hensel's lemma, it, it, it goes wrong. There's, the, the, there's no factorization. So what's gone wrong? Well, um, you remember Hensel's lemma had this condition in it for it to work that um, one of the derivatives of something has to be equal, has to be non-zero. Well, this condition on the derivative really means that alpha zero is a simple zero mod p. Um, roughly speaking, if there are two zeros mod p, then Hensel's lemma doesn't know which zero to converge to in the p-addict, so it kind of goes wrong. But if there's only one zero mod p, then it knows which zero to lift. And the same thing goes on here. Here we've got um, two different zeros for y. So, so, so the zeros modulo x squared of y equals plus x and y equals minus x, which are different, which are OK. But here the two zeros are the same. We have y equals 0 and y equals 0. So this condition about derivatives fails and, and we can't use Hensel's lemma to lift this. Um, so that explains the, gives a geometric explanation of the derivative term in Hensel's lemma. Um, we, we, we need there to be a um, simple zero, otherwise things go wrong. If you're used to doing Newton's method, you know that Newton's method also goes a bit crazy if there are double zeros. The, the convergence gets incredibly slow and um, um, it doesn't really work very well. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that, 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 so that's all about Hensel's lemma.